Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It is the oldest and most renowned of the good government groups, the Goo Goos. It was founded in 1897 to fight Tammany Hall. It has elected a mayor and been an influential voice in New York City affairs for generations. It has expanded and enlarged its reform agenda and today produces the most important and best New York City read on politics, policy, and New York civic life, Gotham Gazette. It is the Citizens Union, and my guest is its executive director, Dick Dady. We'll talk reform, its problems and prospects, obstacles and opportunities. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, Doug. Great to see you. Always a pleasure. Let's talk a bit about the Citizens Union and how you got there. It's expanded activities. Where did right. you come from? You're there three and a half years. What have you done in the three and a half years? You've greatly expanded yeah. what the citizens. Well, I think we've. Does. I think you know, working with a great board and a staff, we've really reinvigorated uh, Citizens Union as, and have begun to reclaim our historic role as a, you know, as an important civic leader on a lot of city issues and increasingly more and more state issues. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, Citizens Union was founded 110 years ago, really to, to you know, fight the corruption of Tammany Hall and the affairs of the city. And, and since that time, it has been really at the forefront of advancing political reform in the city and state and has uh, accomplished many things uh, in, its, uh, in its 110 years. Most recently, you know, the, one of our biggest uh, successes is publishing each and every day, GothamGazette.com, mm -hmm. this online news digest and, news, and, and listing of news stories uh, about what's going on in the city. Which is, in my mind, the absolute best. I mean, I assign it right. to my students. It's right. the only assigned reading. Do you know, do you know what your reach is? I mean, how yeah, many sure. people do you yeah. reach a day? Within, within within a given month, we get about 100, 110,000 unique visitors coming to wow. the site, uh, and you know, regular readers probably uh, a number of about 10,000. Yeah. But it's a great resource tool, research uh, uh, tool as well, and uh, and it's going to hopefully be around and expanded forever. Yes, exactly. Good, good. You, where did you come from? Came from Syracuse, New York, and, and professionally, and, <laughs> sure. and, and 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 why why Citizens Union? Yeah, uh, I moved here to New York about 16 years ago from uh, after having lived in Washington D.C., Boston, and Philadelphia, and you know moved here to head up the Empire State Pride Agenda, uh, which was nothing but an idea at that time, which mm -hmm. is a statewide lesbian and gay political organization, and it helped really uh, develop that organization into a, an effective political voice mm -hmm. for New York State's lesbian and gay uh, community. And uh, but wanted to move on uh, and not be just uh, cornered into uh, mm -hmm. being a, a gay activist and really started to work on some other issues and became a lobbyist and represented a number of other clients and then expanded my issue portfolio. But I missed uh, being in the, you know, focusing on a particular issue and therefore got back involved in single issue uh, agendas by working with city parks mm -hmm. and city parks issues and then moved from city parks issues to you know this broad reform agenda because it wasn't very it wasn't confining at all because mm -hmm. uh, it you know reform doesn't look just at process but actually at the substance and and citizens union has not just been on political reform but weighing in on important issues of, of, of importance to the city and to the state you know that affect all the citizens you know trying to rise above the special interests and really focus on what is you know for the public good and, and the public interest and in your three and a half years there you've really expanded the citizens unions activities you do candidate endorsements right. you well we've said Gotham Gazette you've got your monthly online the reformer and you really become almost the lead among some very good good government groups both <clears throat> at the city and state levels. Yeah, yeah I, think we've, I think we've begun to recapture the, the historical place that we've had in, this, in the city and the states. 
civic life. And we, we have been much more proactive about weighing, on, weighing in on issues and helping to shape the debate and really doing a lot of good, solid research. Uh, you mentioned uh, candidate evaluation, something which we've been doing since 1910, uh, evaluating candidates and supporting candidates for office. What was different last year, uh, and actually the last couple of years, is we've had a very defined agenda against which mm -hmm. we are measuring candidates and really holding a candidates accountable to not what just they said this year, but to two years ago and four years ago. And then the other significant step was actually getting involved in statewide races. We, we right. previously have been involved in city races and state legislative races, but this time was the first time we've weighed in on uh, state comptroller, uh, attorney general, and, and, and governor. And, and, and certainly in this budget cycle, you, uh, the Citizens Union, has been very, very involved in the budget discussions, both process and substance. Let's, let's, let's look at Albany, the first 100 days plus. It sort of reminds us, me of a good news, bad news joke, yeah. that, but it's still a joke. Yeah. It seems to me that both Citizens Union and other of the good government groups, like me, had very high expectations and they weren't quite reached and there's, there's a real sort of level of disappointment out there. There is a level of disappointment, but I think it just goes to show how difficult it is to change Albany. Um, you know, uh, we wanted to believe that this governor could come in and change Albany in the way that we wanted to see it changed. And I think he has uh, been very earnest about it and, and remains very sincere about changing Albany. But I think the reality of how entrenched Albany, uh, Albany is and the special interest role in crafting an Albany agenda, uh, you know, uh, set him back. Uh, but I think that uh, he remains committed to a reform agenda. Um, I think that he's had s some significant accomplishments. I mean, getting a budget done on time and really beginning to shape uh, some of the substance, change the substance of the budget, particularly in, in the area of education and, and uh, health care funding were significant steps forward. But we're not happy with the fact that in order to get to those outcomes, he had to do this uh, behind closed doors, uh, much in the way that we've become too accustomed to. And in fact, arguably, uh, this budget process was worse than it's been in a very, very long yeah, time. I mean, it was really Byzantine and opaque. And, 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 yeah. sen and it seemed to me that the governor was, was steamrolling ahead and the Wednesday before the budget was to be adopted, there was this turnaround, and that deadline drove everything. The, de the deadline drove everything in a way that we've not seen it before, and really, you know, uh, closed the doors. You know, the negotiated deals were were, do were done in secret. Nobody really had any idea what was being cut. And even when the legislation, when the budget was passed, people, even you know, I talked to a legislator today who said that, uh, you know, uh, th th this was this was the worst year that he, since he's been up there, and he's been up there for 12 years now, when the rank and file has been totally cut out of it. Um, so I, we, we, we took a step backwards. We, we, took a st we, we took a step backwards, clearly in the process. Uh, but I think that the governor wanted to, you know, had some very big ideas, felt like he couldn't open up the process. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is my... Uh, you know, I mean, this is what I surmise, is that he felt like he couldn't open up the process because if he opened up the process, he was going to lose on the substance. And he made a very calculated decision to close down the process and, and get some of these changes. What is bizarre about this, though, is to enact some of these reforms, both in education funding and in health care financing, you know, which he did win, you know, uh, some core agreements on. He still had to negotiate secret deals that added onto those uh, core agreements that essentially took us back to where we were before. Well, exactly. I, I spoke to uh, Diana Fortuna yeah. on, on, on last week's show, and you, you have this foundation education aid formula, which really makes sense. I'm looking at it as a policy analyst, as you know, an academic, and it makes sense. So you get it out there. Everybody says, hooray. It comes to the real world, and... Yeah. Nassau County gets the same share it always got. What's, right. what's to prevent it from? So you've got a great formula. What's to prevent it ha from next year, the same politics occurring? Nothing. And that's the sad thing. Now, is, what do is you that, guys do? I mean, meaning the, the civic advocates community. What, how do you exercise influence? Well, I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, I do have to say that uh, the, the doors of government, uh, particularly the second floor where the governor is situated in the Capitol, have, has been much more open to uh, public interests, uh, groups like ours, than they had been under uh, the specifically meaning, uh, you know, meetings, uh, phone calls, uh, uh, chatting with us about the Results? various uh, about the various issues. I mean, we do have to say that, uh, and I think uh, you know, the the first issue out of the the block for him, we were very disappointed in, in the process, in that 
he, he uh, went after ethics reform, which was a big issue and it's right. something that we really pressed him and the other two leaders on to tackle at the beginning of his term. And he did that, uh, but again, he negotiated it behind closed doors uh, and announced an agreement, uh, a three-way agreement, before any of us knew what the details really were, but for the 30-minute uh, phone call that took place beforehand. Uh, so while we were happy with a large part of the substance, we were not happy with the fact that we were, we were cut out of it and that there was no public process to this. So in a sense, the ends, if not justified, at least well, explain the means? I mean, I think that the end, that's a good way of putting it. The end, the end explains the means, but I don't think that it justifies, you know, because if, if, he, you know, if he's really going to change uh, Albany uh, for the better, he's got to open up government. He cannot uh, seek to accomplish his goals by continuing to keep uh, the doors of Albany's government closed. And, okay, and, you, and, and, you, and not very transparent at all. I mean, forget about transparent. I mean, we still don't know what the what, what a lot of the budget means now, and it's yeah. I mean, weeks li later. I mean, literally, that budget was being placed on on uh, on members' desks. Well, uh, State Senator Liz Kruger said it was still warm when yeah. it when it when it reached her <laughs> desk. Right. So yeah. when when the actual roll call was taking place. How Outrage. do you avoid this structurally? Do you change the date? What do you What well, do you do? How do you change the process? I mean, they, they passed this bill, I mean, this law in January where they all said, oh, we're making these great reforms. And, and if you look at the legislation, I've got it. It makes sense. They it ignored was, it. It was a great piece of legislation. You, you guys, know. were you up in Albany yeah, to yeah, celebrate yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. We, we, it was, we pushed it. We supported it. Uh, but we didn't see it uh, followed at all this year. Uh, you know, there were no conference committees except at the, at the very end. You know, there was no kind and of... And it was after the bills were pay basically written up. Right. After all the deals were decided, it was just uh, filling in. Now, you got to still believe that Elliot Spitzer is the best hope for reform in New York he, State. He is no doubt the best hope. Now, year two, what... Well, year I one's mean, not you, yet over. Oh, you, okay. Talk about I, you know, year I mean, one I, not being I mean, over you know, before you, I get to you, year two. We've got the winter term over, and the winter right. term has been focused on the budget. Right. And it's a very truncated period. I mean, keep in mind that he was a new governor, you know, uh, coming in and had to give his first budget presentation by February 1. Right. And He's that only there a month. You know, only there a month, uh, you know, and had it had to be, you know, reviewed and passed by the legislature in two months. Mm -hmm. And it was not your garden variety budget. It really did try to accomplish some major reforms, as we've talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully next year uh, you will see uh, a better effort put forward. Um, but, you know, he ran into a brick wall. Now we've got the spring term. And the spring term really is about hopefully changing the way Albany works. Talk about and, what, do, what do you expect I mean, in I, the spring term? I mean, first and foremost, I mean, we've got to address the issue of campaign finance reform. Uh, something that has been talked about and talked about for, for what, years up there. What constitutes campaign finance reform what, at the state level? What, 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 you know, right now, you know, a candidate for statewide office is able to get, you know, a $55,000 contribution from anybody. And in, in, in and New York is, City, it's much lower than that. In New York it? City, it's, you know, uh, 4750 okay. uh, for citywide. And, of course, we've got public financing uh, at the city level. But on the, on the state level, I mean, an individual can write a $55,000 check to any candidate running for, for statewide office. You know, uh, for, the, for the Assembly and the Senate, you know, it's under $10,000. Um, but these are significant amounts of money. And, uh, you know, what we are hoping he will do is, is a couple things in campaign. Lower the contribution limits. Mm -hmm. He has voluntarily lowered them to 10000 for himself. For right? himself. You know, but we would like to see them go much lower, not only for statewide offices, but for uh, state legislative mm -hmm. offices. You know, greater disclosure about the contributions and uh, uh, the contributors, which, you know, all you have to know is really the name and the address to the contributor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, a stronger campaign finance enforcement unit at the Board of Elections. I mean, you know, we have, we have laws that are not very well uh, followed because there's no ability to enforce them at all. So you're talking from the govern governor's perspective. Th does the legislature want this in any well, way? What's, uh, what's in, uh, the Assembly has been very good historically about passing campaign finance Yeah, because they knew that the state Senate would reject it. Exactly. So, so they've, not, you know, they've always been able to put forward a, a bill knowing that it was going to go nowhere in the Senate. And now that you've got a governor who's very committed to this, it'll be interesting to see where, where the Assembly comes up. Uh, you know, the Assembly and the Governor and the Senate have been negotiating, again, behind closed doors, uh, on an important issue, uh, and we're hoping that there will be uh, some movement on this. But the Senate is very intransigent. 
because it's one of the ways in which the Senate is able to be uh, continually held by the Republican Party. Right. And the other way it's held is that because of the gerrymandered districting. Yeah. And that's another item on yeah. the Citizens Union agenda, and that is legislative redistricting reform. Again, what would this reform look like and what are its prospects? Right now, uh, the way in which uh, district lines are drawn for state legislation, uh, particularly in, in, in Congress, is that the, the legislators essentially choose the voters before the voters get to choose Each them. House. Right. And they gerrymander these districts. Right. And the, the Senate and, the, and the, re, you know, the, the, the Democrats have controlled the Assembly for, what, 34 years, and the Republicans have done the same. And there has been this bargain, you know, this agreement that that, you know, incumbency protection. Incumbency protection, you know, letting each house draw their own lines to protect their majority. And um, we have had the large, the longest divided state government in, uh, in the nation right, right. now. No other uh, state legislature goes as far back as New York State's legislature does in terms of Republican, re Republican uh, control of the Senate. And then the question is, the is that bad necessarily? I mean, you have unified government, or you had unified government at the national level from 2000 to 2006, and when you would argue that yeah. unified government wasn't very successful. It, it, it's not about you know whether it's unified government or divided government, but there should be an opportunity to have a change occasionally, okay. as it has on the national okay. level, right? And what what I guess is you know what we need to actually focus on is the fact that a lot of these rules involving ethics, uh, involving campaign finance, and involving redistricting have been decided by those who are most affected right. by it. Right. And in the case is uh, even more glaring when you look at partisan gerrymandering that they get to draw the lines for themselves. And what we are advocating is that, you know, that the legislature be removed from that responsibility. And we actually have a nonpartisan independent redistricting commission draw which the lines, of lots of states which a lot have. of states right. have, uh, and take that power out of the legislature. Now, wait a minute. T talking about things that you're not going to get, th how does the legislature allow this to occur? Well, I think that, uh, you know, that's where the governor comes in, you know, and that's, that's, that's why there's still hope that, that he will be able to kind of move this reform agenda in this spring term. How? You know, uh, it, it is going to be a heavy lift on gerrymandering. But if he if he puts forward a strong proposal, you know, we've got some uh, 50 supporters of the bill uh, of a Mike Gianaris assembly redistricting mm -hmm. bill in the in the state assembly. Uh, you know, it's it, it you know, it, it's not going anywhere in the state Senate right now. But we hope that we can kind of create the public pressure that is necessary because people are just totally fed up. I was up in Syracuse this weekend and and people's hopes, you know, are, 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 are turning to disappointment because, you know, they've seen the governor who they had much help, hope right. in hit a brick wall. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, let's hope that uh, he'll be able to break through that this OK, winter. another plank, if you will, in the, the Citizens Union pla platform, and these are all integrated, is election reform. Talk about the voting machines that we were supposed to have a couple of elections ago and where we are under mm -hmm. the Help America Votes Act. I mean, why can't we even get voting machines in New York State? What, what is it about us? Well, uh, or you. <laughs> yeah, blame it on me. Yeah, blame, blame, blame no, it on No, you in a generic New yeah. York sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, I mean, after the uh, disastrous presidential election of 2000, Congress passed and the president signed into law this Help America Vote Act, which essentially provided some, you know, loose but nonetheless new standards for the way in which uh, uh, federal elections should be held which uh, also provided money for the purchase of new voting systems. A lot of states went ahead uh, in rather quick form <clears throat> and passed state legislation that made that happen and took advantage of these federal monies. Mm -hmm. New York did not because we could not get, again, the Republicans in the Senate and the Democrats in the Assembly to agree on a unified approach. You know, again, divided government and one of the pitfalls of that divided government. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much, it's, it's not just divided government, but the special interests that don't drive both of those branches mm -hmm. that just keep, you know, any possible agreement for the common good coming together. Um, and, on, you know, we and Spitz are tangled with some of those special interests in the Medicaid cuts. And, you know, there was a little bit of right, bruising right, on both right, sides. Right. And I, you know, I think the thing is, is that Spitzer does have, you know, and, you know, this, the public interest uh, in mind more so than uh, uh, the legislative leaders and, and many of the legislators, and 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 that's what you know he he tried to uh, uh, to focus on, and I think that's what people want him to come back to focus on. Um, but anyways, back to this, you know, the voting machines. We've got you know, we we don't have new voting machines, no. even though several years ago legislation was finally passed. We're the last state in the nation 
to address and, and, this. And then they took money away from us because we were late. They I mean, haven't, they haven't yet like, taken oh, it away. Oh, they haven't. They but, threatened. I'm sorry. Well, they're supposed to, and we're hoping that uh, uh, they ultimately won't. But there's a, uh, you know, even though we were late, uh, our delay may actually benefit us because we will have learned from the mistakes right. of other states. Right. Because in 2006, there were a lot of problems with some of these machines that we're looking at. Yep. But one of the big problems that we have in New York State is that we have this bizarre requirement called the full face ballot. And that when the voter goes into the voting booth or went, goes to vote, they've got to be able to see the full ballot all at once. Mm -hmm. Where every, just about every other state, they're able to go from race to race right. to race. Uh, the, the thinking is, is that you know, you get, you get, if you're further down the ballot, Voters will not vote right. for it. Right, there's so, a turn off. Um, and there's no other, uh, uh, you know, the, the companies are, we're asking to draw up these new prototypes to, to create a full face, full face ballot. And there's this, uh, you know, uh, tension between optical scans, you know, and, and the DREs, which right. are the ATM-like machines. Right, and also the availability of a paper trail. Right, and you know, New York, uh, New York State has required the existence of paper trail, regardless of, uh, of which of the two systems. Uh, both of them have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Public authorities, is this one of the areas where we can move significantly? I mean, that certainly was one of the major arguments that Spitzer made in his campaign. And then Alan Hevesy, you know, the, the former controller, constantly was talking about all of the, you know, the hundreds yeah. of billions of dollars that are expended and, and, and debt burdens of these authorities. I mean, this is the secret branch of government. Oh, I mean, it, go it, ahead. It, it just, it's just, it's, it's outrageous because New York, you know, New York State Constitution has this requirement that the voters must approve right. uh, any kind of debt. And what they've been able to do is get around that constitutional requirement by recreating all these public authorities. And public authorities, you know, uh, do free up uh, an ability to raise capital and then also move forward with important projects. A lot of important public works projects were built by public sure. authorities and have provided a public service. But like anything, they've gotten you know uh, uh, too large, too many, and spending way too much money. And then patronage and, dumps. And their patronage, their patronage dumps. They're not accountable uh, in the way in which they're they're governed. And um, you know, Spitzer, as one of his reforms, is going to focus on public authorities. We did see a little bit of public authority reform on, under Governor uh, Pataki, right. but we still have a long ways to go. And uh, you know, governance and uh, and and managing the debt, and uh, you know, opening up and, and evaluating. I mean, we've got something like close to 700 public authorities, probably half of which we still don't. And we don't need 50 billion dollars worth of debt. Yeah, yeah. Final sort of, not your final, but the final one where we can talk about here before we turn to the city is judicial reform. Right, right. How do we accomplish that? And what would judicial reform look like in New York State? Well, you know, the Brennan Center has successfully litigated this case so far, which is now before the United States Supreme Court, essentially saying that the way in which we currently pick state Supreme Court justices, which is the major trial court, uh, in the state is unconstitutional mm -hmm. in that it doesn't allow enough choice for the voters and allows the party bosses and the party uh, committees to, to select the candidates essentially. So that's, you know, so the, so the current system has been declared un un unconstitutional. But they that's, haven't come up with something that's to replace good. It. That's good. You know, the ultimate long term solution should be a merit appointment system, okay. much like we have for the uh, U.S. Court, uh, the State Court of Appeals, um, and, and much like we choose our uh, family court and criminal court judges uh, here. Here in the city. Um, but you know, that's going to also require a state constitutional amendment. So there needs to be an interim solution. Um, and that interim solution is, you know, do we have direct primary elections? Um, you know, as we choose other, you know, uh, office, uh, elected offices? Or do we reform the, uh, const the, 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 uh, the, const the, the convention system, right? right? right. Um, neither of which are particularly desirable because you certainly don't want to have judicial candidates and current and sitting judges out there raising money from the very lawyers who are going to appear before them. Right, and also controlled by the local political machines, right. which they always are. Right, right, exactly. Or, or go, you know, to, to the uh, continuing the convention system, which is, you know, even more controlled. Right. So ultimately, you know, I mean, it's, it's now having to choose an interim solution has been delayed because the case is before the United States sure. Supreme Court. But hopefully the governor is going to put forward a merit selection or a merit appointment system. Uh, as part of a larger court restructuring. Okay, so you've got this huge agenda. In, in 20 yeah. seconds, what are your two or three top priorities at the state level before we take a very short look at the city level? 
Our number one priority is uh, ending partisan gerrymandering by really having an independent redistricting commission established because we think that that is where the root of all this dysfunction comes from. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, each of the you know each of the party candidates, the major party candidates, play to their bases, right? And there's no attempt because of the way in which the district lines are drawn to try and appeal to a moderate vote. Okay. Uh, so that's our number one. Our number two is campaign finance, trying to reduce the influence of special interest money. Okay. Let's turn to the city, and I, if I may get. Yes. What is campaign finance one of the items on the agenda at the city level? What's the agenda at the it, city it, level? Campaign finance reform is a big agenda item this year in the city um, because ev after every city election, uh, the campaign finance board, which manages the public financing system, mm -hmm. and it's one of the best in the country, if not the model system for, for many in the country, uh, you know, has to analyze uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of the program in light of the experience of the most recently concluded citywide election. The Campaign Finance Board has done that. It's put out a report. It's put forward many recommendations. And it's now up to the city council to react to that and to pass legislation. What are the chief recommendations? It would seem to me that one recommendation is that you can't have rich guys run. <laughs> we don't want to restrict people. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm activity. kidding. Uh, uh, but, you know, one of the biggest things we need to address is restricting uh, uh, you know, the continued influence of special interest money, and that comes in the form of pay to play. Okay. And what that means, and, uh, go ahead. What that means is you know, people who, who have business before the city, uh, whether in the form of contracts or land use, uh, zoning applications, uh, feel like if they're going to have their interests favorably addressed or at least considered, mm -hmm. they need to play. Right. And playing means putting up some money. Sure. Uh, Sometimes there's overt pressure. Uh, som sometimes it's a lot subtle. But everyone wants to make sure that they're that they're not out of the game. So they hedge their bets and they make campaign contributions to either current uh, to current elected officials. Thirty seconds left. Two other priorities on the city level that Citizen Union is going to press. Well, we've got uh, you know such main mundane issues as uh, uh, you know the Franchise and Concessions Review Commission. They're trying to change. The, the, the relationship uh, between the council or between the mayor and uh, the borough president's role, right. and the controller's role, and that's a, a, a you know where a lot of major concessions and franchise agreements are reached. Lots of bucks. Uh, you know, we're also gonna, we're also beginning to take a look at non-reform issues, but you know, mayoral control of city schools is a big issue. We're going to take a look at uh, police oversight because of the way in which the city uh, police department disciplines its officers is is not very transparent and needs to be improved. Do we expect to see any movement on these issues? When, uh, when can you come back and talk to us whether we've succeeded or not so succeeded? I'd be happy to come back in a couple of months you know, okay. after, after the legislature. And, we'll and we'll talk about the, these various activities and possibilities. Yeah, yeah, I think we're only and you're, opti you're optimistic? I, 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 I'm an optimistic guy. Uh, but I think that you know, we've got a great governor who is still committed to this reform agenda. And we'll see what happens in the next three and months. And we'll see you're optimistic at the city level as well? I think we'll see some major movement on this pay-to-play restriction, which will be huge in the city. Excellent. Thank you.